Hello, welcome back to You Are My Borough, myself, Dom Shaw, and Scott Wilson, both of the Northern Echo, our second video podcast of the week, as promised. If you haven't watched or listened back yet to our first to our first episode earlier this week, that was looking back on the season. Today, we're going to look ahead, a very early glance ahead at the summer transfer window. Just a heads up before we start, uh, we mentioned earlier this week that we're going to do a live vid uh, next Wednesday morning we're going to do that um, on YouTube obviously so if there's anything you want us to discuss on there just give us a shout leave it in the comments section of this video or the comment section from the video earlier this week or get in touch with myself and Scott on on Twitter and we can discuss what you want discussing next week how are we doing Scott all right I'm good yeah yeah all good thanks Don the sun's shining the uh, summer summer's here so uh, so um yeah, it's been beauty the last couple of days, hasn't it? Guy, has an half. Um, it has, it has. It's, it, it, it felt like right up until the last week of the season, you were still going to matches thinking it could rain at any time. Whereas now the, the switch has been flicked, and uh, and yeah, summer's here, so it's um, it's quite nice, really, isn't it? You, you do need a bit of it. It's a long old season with plenty going on, and um, you need a bit of a refresh, I think. So, uh, so well, yeah, at Cardiff, at Cardiff, it was freezing at Cardiff a couple of weeks ago, um, yeah. But but I was only saying then, I don't think it's been, uh, like I realised with 90 seconds in here and this is already proper boring talk, but I don't think it's been that cold a season. I can't remember many games. <laughs> like, uh, like, absolutely. Bit. That COVID season, like, uh, God, like we were so yeah. lucky to be wearing games. But because the balls were so empty, it was absolutely bit, yeah. wasn't it? No There were some pressure. real shockers there, wasn't there? Yeah. Um, no, um, I, it wasn't... It, it never felt like there was the real snow and ice. It just felt like spring was wet and windy, wasn't it? Yeah. Every time you were going to a game in the spring, it was like, it wasn't that cold, but it was like, I need a coat, I need something with a hood, I'm going to get wet. Um, and there was an awful lot of that, like. So, yeah, let's get summer. Let's get some summer. In let's, the get, let's get ready for pre-season in Bishop Auckland. In the absence of service station talk, now the season's finished, we can talk weather instead for the foreseeable future exactly. until, until it all returns. Um, yeah, so looking ahead, to the early tra- uh, looking ahead early to the transfer window, it is very early, clearly. Um, the season only finished last week, so, so this is just uh, a, an early glance at what might come this summer. But there are certain things we already know. We know Paddy McNair is leaving Borough this summer. That comes as no surprise. We know that Borough won't be activating the uh, clause to make Sam Greenwood's loan deal permanent and Borough won't be signing Lewis O'Brien or Luke Thomas um, either after their respective loan deals this season. Let, let's start with McNair. Um, it's no secret that he was the highest earner at the club. It, that's felt inevitable, hasn't it, for, for, for a number of months that McNair was going to move on this summer. Yeah, I think... <laughs> I know I'm probably speaking a bit here with kind of hindsight and looking good after the event, but I think it's felt ever since Michael Carrick came in that he hasn't massively fancied Paddy McNair. Like, there was all the talk when Carrick first came in of their Man United links and McNair would be a key player. And, well, you know, if Michael Carrick's had defenders available, he's tended not to be picking Paddy McNair. And then, obviously, there's been the injury issues and everything. So... Listen, six years, he's been a brilliant servant for Bure. He was player of the season in one of those years, wasn't he? He's done a, a, a you know, a, a sterling job in a number of different positions, midfield, centre-half, full-back. We've seen him pretty much everywhere um, in, in a kind of defensive role. Um, he's been a really good servant, but it feels probably right that the time's to move on. I mean, that said... It feels like Paddy McNair should be about 37, doesn't it? He's not. <laughs> he's nowhere near that. You know, he can. He will still be able to potentially go and do a job somewhere else. But, yeah, throw in the fact that, like you say, he was the last remaining contract from the era when Borough were throwing a reasonable amount, you know, a fair bit of money around. He was the highest earner. Clearly, Borough were not going to be offering him that again. Well, um, it felt pretty inevitable that he was going to move on. I think the, the links for Rangers are interesting. I mean, I, you know, I, I haven't dug too deep into them. I don't know quite how much there is in that. But certainly north of the border, that seemed to be touted as a potential move for him. That would be interesting. Yeah, and, and I know for a fact that there's interview for, uh, there's interest from overseas as well. Um, now, now, whether McNair, that would appeal to McNair at this stage, I'm, I'm not sure. Loot, domestically, Luton were always strongly linked. Feels like Stoke have yeah. been linked about three dozen times. Forever, yeah. Five years. Um, 
Yeah. He feels very stoke. He feels very stoke. Well, had, 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 he been, had this been happening four or five years ago, stoke would have been well three done. to one on them. Especially when Michael O'Neill. Especially when Michael O'Neill yeah. was half of that. Um, you know, as it is, I'm not sure that the money is quite there at stoke anymore, but they always seem to find a bit, don't they? They always seem to be able to throw a bit of money somewhere down the line. So, I, yeah, that, that, I still wouldn't rule that out. When you, when you look back at the... the Around the time when McNair signed, there was a, there was a fair few misses, wasn't there? Um, now, it, it, there have been ups and downs of, of of McNair's time at Borough, but there's no doubt he's he's been a hit when you look at the amount of games he's played, how how crucial he's been, the, the, the various different roles he's held out, and when you consider the likes of Aidan Flint, George Savile, um, who came and disappointed also for big money. But, McNair, looking back, although he was clearly a, a significant investment, it, it was a good signing. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think you can. I don't think you can argue against that. And, you know, and for, like you say, for lots of reasons, the number of games he's played, the influence he's had in the team, the fact that that a number of different managers have been able to rely on him to dig them out of a hole when they've been short of a defensive midfield or short of a centre half or short of a full. Well, it's all right. Paddy McNair can slot in, and and you know. I think every team needs a player like that, don't they, within the squad who, when you know, when, when your back's up against the wall and, and you've got injury problems or whatever, you can you can call on them to do a job that they're not absolutely ideally suited for, but you know they're going to be able to do that job. And, and that's been Paddy McNair. And in some ways, that's damning him with fame praise because, I, you know, he is, or certainly at his peak, he was a better footballer than that. You know, Paddy McNair has been a very, very good player and I'm sure will go on to be a very, very good player. But um, but I think his biggest value from a Borough point of view was the fact that he could slot in where and whenever he was needed. At, at the top of his reference list on his CV this summer, I'm sure it'll be Neil Warnock because he described him as the best player he's ever managed, didn't he, when he was a... Yeah. Now, there might be an element of Warnock's man management skills coming into play there, but he was massive at that time, wasn't he, for Borough? At that era. Warnock's going to have Paddy McNair at the back, Anthony Dyke Steele at right, Ab Adele Tarrapped up front. <laughs> oh, Sol Bamba. So uh, there's a there's a there's a sum of it. Yeah. There's a sum of it here, isn't the Neil Warnock's dream team? The, the Warnock eleven. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you'll get him on. Get him on to do it. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that was probably when he was at his most influential, wasn't it? And and that season when Burra let's be honest, pretty much scrambled to safety under Warnock. Um, in and around that time and then into the next season, yeah, was was probably peak McNair. It was such a strange time. I mean, looking back when, obviously, he signed uh, and, 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 he, and he looked a good fit for Tony Pulis's borough. And then he didn't, he barely got a kick, didn't he, in that in that first year? Yeah. That was strange. Um, but best of luck to Paddy, where, wherever he goes. This summer, uh, best of luck for him. Hope it all, hope it all works out for him in the future. Um, Sam Greenwood is going back to Leeds. Obviously, uh, he's spent the year here on loan. There was an there was an option to um, to make that deal permanent for for one and a half million pounds. And I remember we might have even headlined a video on it at the back end of last year when mm -hmm. he, he was really he was he, he was really influential. He, he looked like Borough's match winner, game changer at that time. We we touched on it in the video earlier this week. He just didn't kick on, did he? The second half of the season was a real disappointment. No, I mean, it, when, when the news first came out of the £1.5 million buyout kind of clause, I think everybody was absolutely staggered that Leeds had agreed to that and thought that Borough were getting the absolute steal of the century. And, and the fear at the time, wasn't it, was that Leeds were going to get promoted and so Greenwood would get uh, um, an, an upgrade in his wages and would would be priced out of the borough. Now, what are we? Four months on or something like that? We're at the situation where Borough have decided that actually they can probably spend that one and a half million pounds in a better way. And, and had you said that, when, as I say, the news first came out about the deal, I think people would have, would have laughed you out of town because at that point, it looked like Greenwood was ready to kick on to become match winner in the championship and you're right it just didn't happen um his influence on games waned uh, he was no longer making the kind of dynamic runs that, that he was making at his peak 
I guess to a certain extent, there's only so far you can go dining out on set pieces, free kicks, all that kind of stuff, which was one of the criticisms, I think, of him at Leeds, that if you, if you could, you know, American football style, bring on a set piece specialist, <laughs> Sam Greenwood would be absolutely top of your list. But actually, football doesn't work like that. And what he does in and around that doesn't, doesn't live up to the hype. And that's probably what we saw in the end with Borough, wasn't it? To the point where... In the last what month, two months of the season, he was struggling to get into the team. Well, I think uh, not even with hindsight, but when the fact he didn't, he, the fact he wasn't, he didn't start for the last few games of the season, I think was a was a clear indicator of of what was to come this summer. It feels like a big summer for him. I know this doesn't, I know this doesn't concern Borough now, but he's twenty two, he's twenty three early next year. If if Leeds go up. And, and, and obviously we don't know how the playoffs are going to play out. But if, if Leeds go up this summer, then he's not going to feature in Daniel Fark's plans because he couldn't get him in Fark's team in the championship. Um, even if Leeds stay down, well, you look and think the likes of Somerville and, and Nonto are likely to move on. But he clearly has a lot to do to convince Fark. It, it, this, mm. this looked like an ideal opportunity for him to really kick on and establish himself as a as a as a first team regular somewhere. It feels like an important few months ahead, I think. Yeah, he's he's starting to turn one of those players that just has constant low moves and can never really find a home, isn't he? From a from a very bright start. In some ways, a player that, that I'd maybe like him to a little bit in that respect is Patrick Roberts, who was the next big thing at Man City, didn't quite work. Had a decent loan move at Celtic, but then had a succession of loan moves, Borough obviously included, before ending up at Sunderland, where he kind of has found a home. But but even even this season, he's really struggling to to do it at Championship level and then live up to his billing. Well, is Greenwood going to turn into that type of player where he has another couple of loan moves that don't really work, and, and then in the end, he ends up at a kind of bottom half Championship side, and that turns into his home? Kind of hope not, because as I say, I, you know. I was. I do remember when he was coming through at Sunderland, and every big Premier League club in the country was sending scouts to watch Sam Greenwood in in Sunderland's under twenty ones. And you know, the, it was where was he going to end up? Obviously, he ended up at Arsenal. Um, so it would be a real shame if his career did peter out. But I think you're absolutely right. I think if if, if he can't make a success of whatever he ends up with next season, then he's going to be a long, long, long way off the player that was coming through at Sunderland. And like I say, every every big club in the country was one. And what must have been the balance for Borough over the last few weeks or months in recruitment meetings is what we've seen from Greenwood in the second half of the season. He, he, he clearly hasn't made it a, a must for Borough to sign him like, like the indications were might have been the case at the back end of last year, but then niggling away in the back of everyone's mind must have been the potential and what he could be. And and, yeah. and if we can just if we can just smooth out those rough edges and and, and get more consistency from him, and and you know you, uh, you've got the term we used at the start there, a, a, a real match winner. That that that's that that must have been the balancing act really. But ultimately, at a time when Borough. Um, clearly that's an area that needs addressing. They, they, they clearly felt that they were better off looking elsewhere. Yeah, and, and you know, it will be a balance that because at the age that he's got, the profile that he's got, as I say, the reputation that he had when he first came through, it, it, <coughs> it, it is not absolutely out of the question that in five, four or five years' time, Sam Greenwood is a £20 million player. That's not out of the question. So if Borough have the chance to sign him for one and a half million, well, you know, that's the that's the deal of the century, isn't it? But as you rightly say, there's clearly been far too many reservations. You wonder if some of that as well is is Carrick's judgment on his day-to-day training and and just everything around that. You know, I, I I'm not saying that from a position of any kind of insight. That's not something I've been told by people in and around the club at all. But Clearly, Carrick is looking at him every day. He's making a judgment on him every day. And as the season's gone on, he's decided, actually, you're not for me. Final one on Greenwood. You you wonder whether Sunderland might be tempted? 
Well, there's the link there, isn't there? Obviously. Um, and they might be losing a certain left winger this summer, might they? Who's uh, been ripping it up in the championship. So there would definitely be a gap there, potentially. Um, I mean, like you, I, I find it hard, whatever happens with Leeds, whether they go up or don't go up, I find it hard to see Farker kind of bringing him back into the fold and, and rolling out the welcome mat and having and, and giving Sam Greenwood a, a, another chance at Leeds. So I think he will be moving on somewhere. And um, it's not going to be Premier League, is it? So, yeah, I could Sunderland, I could definitely see. L Lewis O'Brien, um, maybe slightly more surprising than, than the Greenwood news in that uh, he's, he's, he's got better as opposed to Greenwood kind of disappointing as the season went on. O'Brien has got better as the season went on. Obviously, mainly because his season was majorly disrupted by that serious injury he suffered at Watford, I think it was back in September. When, when he came in, I know we've talked about it on, on, on the vids and pods before. I remember being at his unveiling and he told about how he felt like he had a point to prove after his disappointment season at Forest. And in the early stages of the season, uh, he, he, he had to be patient and then he had to do a job at left back because of the struggles at the time of Lucas Engel and Alex Bangura come in and got injured. Then playing at left back, he got the injury at Watford, was out four months came back and and we, we saw flashes, didn't we, in the final weeks and months of the season of the player who was one of the championship standout midfielders a couple of seasons ago at Huddersfield. But as we discussed on this vid only a couple of weeks ago, his Nottingham Forest salary was always likely to be a major stumbling block. He, he signed for big money there at a time when they'd just gone to the Premier League. Um and 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 there was still perhaps the question mark as to whether he was exactly what Borough wanted in midfield because it was quite a small sample in which he was being judged by, really. Yeah, it, it is the more surprising one. It is the more surprising. I wouldn't have been surprised if Borough had, had tried to sign O'Brien. No, no. I, I think you're yeah. right. I, I strongly suspect that a lot of this is coming down to money and just how much um, money Borough would have to commit to that in terms of both a signing fee and wages because, as you rightly say, he joined a Premier League club on Premier League money on a lengthy contract. So it was never going to be an easy or a cheap deal for Borough to do. They clearly feel that for the amount of money that they would have to have committed to that, they can get a better midfield option. Um, and, you know, you can make the argument that that maybe there is a different type of midfielder that Borough need rather than O'Brien because they've got Wilson again now for another season. They've got Barlasser. They've got Hackney within there. You know, what do you need to complete that midfield mix? Well, O'Brien was ticking a lot of boxes, but, you know, in, in some ways, a bit like Paddy McNair, his versatility was one of his major assets. The fact that he could slot in at left back when Borough needed him at the start of the season. Well, you know, you'd like to think that maybe Carrick and the recruitment team are looking at it and thinking, well, actually, let's work out what we really need to complete that midfield and let's get a specialist who ticks all of those boxes. And, and I'm sure O'Brien would have ticked some of them, but for the amount of money they would have had to commit to that deal, they're clearly looking elsewhere. And, um, and what is it, Burrenid? Is is it someone more in the mould of Johnny House? Because uh, here we go again with, you know, House and approaching the end and all that that you can't help but talk about. Um, but but when Housen's not in the team, you're still it's still instantly recognisable that they're missing that sort of player. Not not just Housen, yeah. clearly they miss Housen, but also that sort of player. And Bailassa and Hackney and O'Brien, none of them, none of them are quite the same, are they? And, and I know we've been saying, kind of looking to talk like this because we've been saying it for two or three years now, but at some stage, we're going to have to plan for life after Housen. And as we've talked about previously, a better way of doing that is bringing someone in who's kind of a seamless replacement. So, when Housen does decide to hang up his boots, his replacement is already there and you're not having to go out and uh, and sign him there and then. Is is that what Borough need this summer? More, more of someone in that mould? I think it would be a, a logical move for them to make, wouldn't it? Because, you know, as we saw last season on the, on the thankfully, fairly few occasions when Housen was missing, the Barlassa, O'Brien, Hackney blend... You're, you're defensively vulnerable if you're playing with a four. Whatever you pick with that, I would argue. Mm. So I think there is a need um, to do... And, and, you know, yeah, without going over all around again, as you quite mm. rightly keep on saying, Johnny Housen's, what, 36 at the end of this month? Um, 
can he do another full season in the championship? Probably. <laughs> you know, we keep on saying he can't. He probably will. We'll be having this exact same conversation again next summer. But I don't think Borough would be succession planning well enough if they weren't starting to think, right, what happens next season if Johnny Allison can only play half the matches? What, what does our midfield look like then? Well, O'Brien, Balassa, Hackney, Azaz, further up the field, whatever. You, 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 prob- you, you probably need a, another more defensive option in there, don't you? Well, well, interestingly, and um, when Michael Carrick spoke to Mark Drury, BBC T's after the game at, against Watford on the final day, and he talked about Housen's contract, and he, he he talked about the importance of him and, and how great he is on and off the pitch, but he also talked about the need to potentially manage him moving forward. Now, that's only possible if you've got someone who can come in and does and do the job that Housen does. And at the minute, I don't, I don't think. Borough have that, which again, I think is probably an indicator of what they're likely to be looking for this summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and you know, again, we saw it last season on occasions, didn't we? When 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 Johnny Housen wasn't in that Borough team, it felt like they were much easier to break against and counter against and, and teams could get at the, that back form much easier. Um, and so, yeah, I think that will be something Borough will be looking at this summer. The, the least surprising of the lot, um, no disrespect, is Luke Thomas. He, he came in at a time when Alex Bangura had suffered the injury, so was facing a, a spell on the sidelines. Obviously, Hayden Colson had been allowed to go to Blackpool on loan. That left Lucas Engel as the only uh, orthodox left back, left wing back. So he, he came in as cover there, um, and he played in the in the last few games of the season. I've seen a few fans questioning why that was the case when it was clear he was moving on, but Engel. Couldn't play in those last few games for personal reasons. Bangura had not long been back from injury. Carrick's talked repeatedly about being reluctant to rush players back too quickly. Um, Thomas is another one. He's played an FA Cup final. He's been knocking on the England door in the past. Clearly hugely talented, but never really staked the claim to make the deal permanent. It always felt like more of a... Oh, not really. Not really. And I think left back's an interesting position this summer because I, you know I think we can write here and Coulson out of the equation, can't we? So, well, just to jump uh, in, Blackpool, in, Blackpool's boss has already made it clear that he'd like to sign Coulson on a permanent team, so yeah. that's a possibility. So, so you know, is either Ingel or Bangura going to be absolutely nailed on as Borough's first choice left back next season? Are we going to see a scenario where the two of them? kind of interchange throughout the season to cover it that way? Or is Michael Carrick deep down thinking, I'm not sure I absolutely want to hang my hat on either of them. Do, do Borough need a left back? Mm-hmm. Whether that be permanent or whether that be a loan come the end of the window? I mean, it doesn't feel like a priority position in that they've got two players there who really can do the job. Um, And I know we can't constantly keep harking back, but neither of them... Neither of them are Ryan Giles, are they? And I'm not saying that Burrick can necessarily go out and sign another Ryan Giles, but it wouldn't surprise me if somewhere they're thinking, well, you know, what options are there out there? Because it doesn't feel like either at the moment, Engel or Bangura, while they've both got their strengths, don't get me wrong, and, you know, they're more than capable of doing a job in the championship. It doesn't feel like either of them are going to be in the top five or six left-backs in the championship last season, which Borough had when they had Giles? Yeah, no, Bear, or... yeah absolutely, absolutely. I, th- I think you nailed it there, but it's it's perhaps not an absolute priority, but I think it's certainly an area to be discussed. Interestingly, um, and, and we've got these quotes going online on, on Monday morning and in, uh, and in Monday's paper, Carrick talks about Bangura and how desperately frustrated he's been at how his first season has played out. He obviously had that injury. I, I, th- I think that's probably the one question mark there. What What's Bangura look like with 15 consecutive games under his belt? Yeah, in a, in a we haven't seen team, that, have we? Team. We haven't seen that. I think Engel's been sound, but not spectacular. Um, had good games, had bad games. Perfectly fine. But as you say, he's not Ryan Giles. But then again... De Boer have a Ryan Giles on the right side of the defence now because Ryan Giles got 11 assists last season, which was, we were talking last summer about how on earth do you replace that? Well, Luke Ayling came in with eight assists in 11 games. It 
it was a must. He made that a must of trying to sign him, didn't he? It, it, it became that effective that quickly. Um, and it was celebrated at the weekend when Carrick first said that they, they want to sign him. And then uh, Luke Ayling told Mark Drury, BBC T's on the pitch, that a deal's close. That'll be a big boost for Bury if you get that done early doors. Yeah, that'd be a good start in the summer, wouldn't it, in terms of bringing us in? Because straight away, you've got, you know, we talk about the the, the top five, six <laughs> left in the championship. Well, you know, I think Leeds clearly don't really think that, but but I think Luke Ayling is. I think I think he, you know, on the evidence of the way he played for Borough in the second half of the season, I think he is amongst the top five or six right backs in the championship. So if you can get that deal done straight away for a player that's already integrated into the squad, already part of the dressing room, already massively popular, clearly enjoying himself, then that's a massive tick in the box. And yeah, that would be a big start for Borough. And all indications are that it's very close and it's likely to happen. So as long as that deal gets over the line, then then that's you know that's one kind of problem boxed off, sold straight away onto the next one, isn't it? The, the, obviously, there are very. We could go on here for forever and a day. Um, the the goalkeeper situation. What happens with Solbrin and, and Zach Hemming coming back? Um, the futures of the likes of Hayden Hackney. Will there be interest in Rav Vandenberg? You, you could go on and on. Obviously, we're not going to do this. I, this is just an early look ahead to the summer window. We've got a summer's worth to fill of these videos and podcasts. So we have to hold <laughs> summer back. But let's just rattle through then the areas that Borough are likely to strengthen this this summer. Clearly, they're going to look to strengthen up front. They've got Latte Laft, who's been a revelation in the last dozen or so games. And, and, and you know, it, it takes something special to come in this summer for Latte Laft to not start next season as first choice striker. We talked about Josh Coburn in the video earlier this week. Attacking midfield is clearly now an area that will be strengthened. That's on Borough's wish list. Morgan Rogers went in January. Matt Crooks went in January. I know Finn Azaz came in, but Azaz came in before Rogers has went. Azaz didn't come in as yeah. a replacement for Rogers. Now Greenwood's gone back. So bringing in at least one attacking midfielder is obviously a priority as well. Midfield, we've touched on there. Right back sorted. We've touched on left back. Centre half, do, does Paddy McNair need replacing? You've got Daryl Lenahan, Dale Fry, Rav Vandenberg and Matt Clark, who was obviously excellent in the second half of the season. Is that enough or do you need to bring someone in there? Do, do you potentially look at bringing in a, a younger player, one for the future, who's who's not necessarily first team ready straight away? What do you reckon? Yeah, I think, I think the fact that there's those four centre-halves on the books, assuming that all four stay, which there's no reason to think that they wouldn't. So Vandenberg, um, Fry, Lenahan, Clark. I think that's the basis of a of a pretty good central defence. You've got you you know you've got different options there. You've got Vandenberg as the kind of young progressive one. You've got Lenahan as the gnarly kind of championship veteran. You've got Clark who's been reborn. Um, I think what that does give you the opportunity to do is maybe like like you suggested there, take a little bit of a gamble on a relatively young, you know, un, unproven but clearly with a lot of talent and potential. In some ways, exactly what they did with Vandenberg. Um, and you've got the score that if they're not quite ready in the first half of the season, well, that's not that's not a disaster, assuming your centre half avoid the kind of injury crisis that we've seen this time around. So, um, I think what we'll see with Borough this summer in general is a blend of those kind of young development signings, which clearly are at least with half an eye on the future, and a couple of more kind of oven-ready championship players ready to go straight in, if you like. Potentially, some of them will be on loan. So, you know, Borough's model is clearly tilting more towards, you know, we want to be able to sign and develop young players. But that's not to the exclusion of, if a deal for a Luke Ayling comes up, we will more than happily do it. So I think we'll continue to see that blend. I think the tack is interesting because... It's felt for most of this season like Borough had to go out this summer and sign a, a, a proper number nine, a proven goal scoring, lead the line number nine. Now, there's clearly still a massive gap that needs filling in that attacking rank. Um, but does the fact that Latalaf has been so effective in the second half of this season and will start next season front come what may, you would imagine. 
does that mean that actually Borough can be a little bit more flexible in terms of the type of forward that they're going for? And if if it's more of a number 10 that comes onto the onto the market, if it's more of a wide attacker who could play up front if they needed him to, maybe that now is a more palatable option than what it felt like two or three months ago when it felt that if Borough didn't bring in a line lead and number nine, then what on earth, you know, who on earth was going to be that first attack and name on the team sheet next season. Well, we know it's going to be latter lats. So I think I think what that's done is it, it's probably afforded Borough the luxury of actually being able to cast their net probably a little bit wider now in terms of the type of forward that they want. I mean, I still think their major summer signing needs to be a forward. Um, you know, you can you can bring in loan players, you can but if they're gonna commit a chunky sum of money to a player. It's surely going to be a forward. But I think now they can be a little bit more flexible and creative with that because Latalas proved that he will, you know, he all things being equal, he will be leading the line next season. So, you know, what do you need then to supplement that, to provide cover for that, to assist that, whatever? Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, you know, a, a, let's say a Kiva Moore style number nine, which in January... It felt like that's what Borough need. Why haven't they got... That's what Borough need. Well, yeah, you know, I can see the argument that maybe they still do need that. But actually, would Keeper Moore play up front with Latter Lath and would you get the best out of both of them? Maybe not. So I think I think that's now a more interesting conversation. Undoubtedly. Um, it promises to be an interesting and exciting summer and one that we'll obviously discuss at length in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, we'll be back next Wednesday to do a live Q&A and I'm sure transfers will feature heavily in there. So do get in touch. As I said at the start, leave your comments with any questions or issues you want discussing or get in touch with myself or Scott on, on Twitter or drop us an email um, and we'll be back early Wednesday morning. We'll, we'll let you know on Twitter. Uh, exactly what time we'll be we'll be going live. Enjoy your week, the rest of your weekend. Enjoy early start of next week. We'll be back. Enjoy next the week. sunshine. Exactly, exactly. As as we're going to those Cardiff freezing Cardiff afternoons being banished into the past already. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Scott. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on Wednesday. Bye, everyone.